Thank you, Maurice. Uh, if you're already there, go ahead and stay in the passage in Ephesians 4. If you're not there, go ahead and turn there, because uh, we're going to spend a lot of time there uh, this morning. Good morning. It's good to be with you all. It's certainly a blessing to worship our God together today, to remember the Lord's death, to sing songs of praise, to pray together. It is good to be with you all today. To some point, it's hard to believe that almost five years ago was the first time I came to university. Uh, I was a a college student, uh, a lot younger than now, and that was a big decision for me because I had only ever been part of one congregation. It was a lot smaller congregation, a place where I grew up, I knew everybody, everybody knew me. Coming down here, I hadn't really been here before. And so, this was a decision. What congregation was I going to join? University happened to be the first one that I visited, but I visited around a little bit and ended up deciding on university for a variety of reasons. And one thing that came up for me time and time again, and I heard from other college students and other members as well, is the idea that university is a family. The idea that there is unity here. That aspect of this congregation. And so that's the thing we're going to discuss a little bit this morning is unity of the body. We're going to be focusing in Ephesians chapter 4. Unity is certainly important. As unity contributes to growth, unity is what God desires. Unity is what Jesus prayed for before His betrayal, before His death. So certainly, it's something we must study. Pick up in Ephesians 4. Uh, We'll go a few verses prior to where Maurice read. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Paul here says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Notice verse 3. It says, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Certainly, there is this idea that we are united in Christ. And it goes further in verse 4. There is one body, one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We are united in Christ. Unity of the Spirit. And that is all about what God has done. And we can go back to chapter 2 to see well, how, how are we united by God. We'll look at chapter 2, verse 13. He says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. United together by the blood of Christ. Verse 16, In one body to God through the cross. We are united together because of the cross. Verse 18, For through Him we both have our access in one Spirit to the Father. Through God the Father we are united. Verse 19, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. We are united by the identity that He gives us. We are fellow citizens. We are of the same household. We are no longer strangers. All because of what God has done. Look at verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. We are united by Him being our foundation. By Him being our cornerstone. Certainly, we are united in Christ. But look further back at the text that Maurice read for us. Look at verse 11. He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, 
to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. We are united in Christ, but we must all attain to the unity of the faith. We are united in Christ, but we must continually strive to be one with one another. This language is not unique to Paul, but look over at how Jesus spoke in John 17. How Jesus prayed. John 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer before He was betrayed and eventually crucified. Look at how He prays. Look at the language He uses. We'll pick up in verse 6 of John 17. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me I have given to them. And they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you. And they believed that you sent me. Certainly these apostles, these disciples, they were united by God. Why? Verse 6, they kept His Word. Verse 8, they had the same belief in Christ. He goes further in verse 12, that Jesus was keeping them in God's name. Verse 16, that they were not of this world. They were alike in that manner. And so certainly these disciples, these apostles, they were united by God. But look how Jesus prays further in verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in Me through their Word, that they may all be one, even as You, Father, are in Me and I in You, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that You sent Me. The glory which You have given Me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and You in Me, that they may be perfected in unity." so that the world may know that You sent Me and love them even as You have loved Me. Notice verse 21. Jesus prays that they may all be one. But didn't we just see in verse 6, 7, 8, 12, 16, weren't they already one in Christ? But so that they could be one with one another. In verse 23, that they would be perfected in unity. That that unity would be mature. That that unity would grow. Certainly they were united in Christ. They were united by God, but they had to be one with each other. Like them, we are united in Christ as well. But we must continually strive to be one. Our unity must be closer. Our unity must grow. And so with those things in mind, we're going to have three considerations with our Ephesians 4 passage. And the first of which is this. Despite having the same identity, we must continually strive for unity. Strive to be one. Now let me give a couple examples of what I mean by that. That may may sound strange at first. Aren't they already one? Well, In 2004, the NBA Finals commenced with the Los Angeles Lakers and the Detroit Pistons. The Lakers were expected to be there. They were the preseason title favorites by far. They were a loaded team, had four future Hall of Famers, where the other team only had one. All these Lakers players, they were all united by having the same logo on their jersey. They were united in name, but they were not united together. They were not one. As there was a lot of tension and fights between players, pride and egos were just causing a bunch of chaos. And so they ended up losing the finals pretty quickly. And I hope you get the idea. They had the same identity. They were all Lakers, but they were not one together. Now for a biblical example, turn over to 1 Corinthians. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to see this same idea. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at verses 1 and 2, and as we read this, notice the words that are used to describe the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2. Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, Sosthenes our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified, saints by the Holy with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Notice in verse 2, the church of God, they are unified. To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, this same identity, saints by calling. All who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. They had the same Lord. So certainly they're united. They're one. Yet look at verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And so, do you see the dichotomy? That these Corinthian brethren, yes, they were united by God. They were united in Christ. They had the same identity. But they were not unified among each other. They were dividing over different teachers in this passage, and other things later on in the book. They needed to strive for unity among each other. They had to be one together. And there's effort that goes into that. And so for us, how can we strive to be one? How can we grow in our unity? We'll return back to our Ephesians 4 passage. And we'll have some suggestions from Paul. Look at the end of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. How can we strive to be one? Look at verse 20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. There's a couple of things here. How can we strive to be one? Well, remember who we're serving. Remember who the focus should be on. Remember who the glory is. That's going to God. It's not going to us. And consider, it is something we should be praying about as well. That He can do far more abundantly. There may be some people you think, I cannot be unified with them. Well, pray about that. God can answer those prayers. God can soften hearts. Certainly, that those are a couple of suggestions. Now look at chapter 4, verse 1 once again. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. What do you need to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit? You have to have verse 2. You have to have humility. You have to have gentleness. You have to have patience. You have to have tolerance and love. Another suggestion Look down at verse 22 of chapter 4. Putting aside the old self. It says, You lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of the seat, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. What does that new self mean? What is laying aside the old self and putting the new self on look like? Look at verse 25. Therefore, laying aside 
falsehood. Lay aside falsehood and do what? Speak truth. Each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. What else should we do? Look at verse 26. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. Put away anger, put away wrath. And instead, look at verse 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. What else should we do? Verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer. Someone may well say, well, I don't have a problem at all with stealing. Well, what's the solution to not stealing? I think it's also uh, with selfishness as well, because then it says, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Put off selfishness, put off stealing, and share, and give. Be generous. Verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Put away this destructive speech, this abusive speech, this corrupt and foul speech. That's not growing unity. That's not building up one another. But rather, look at the end of verse 29. But only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. So that it will give grace to those who hear. Now I recognize we just went through a lot of principles and a lot of commands there. And so for a moment, let's put those into a narrative. Look at Acts chapter 2. Hold your place in Ephesians and go over to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to see these same concepts here as well. Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching at Pentecost. And what happens there? Peter begins concluding his sermon in verse 36 of Acts chapter 2, where he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucify." goes on to say, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all, for all who are far off. As many as the Lord our God will call to himself. With many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized. That day, there were added about 3,000 souls. And so here, we see Peter preaching. We see the reception to the gospel And we see that these people are united in Christ as they received the Word. They repented of their sins. They were baptized. And the Lord added them to the church. Yet, what do they go on doing? Because they're they're united in Christ, right? They're they're one in Christ. So they, they don't need to do anything more because they're one. Look at verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They were building unity with each other. They were striving to be one with each other. Verse 42, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to speaking, teaching, and following truth. Following God's Word. Verse 42, they were devoted to fellowship. The breaking of bread to prayer. They were devoted to one another, to building up one another, encouraging and edifying one another. Verse 44, And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. They had all things in common. And they were selling possessions for those in need. That's what we saw back in Ephesians 4. That they're not selfish. 
But they were laboring for one another so that they could give and share. So they were kind and had a tender heart. Verse 46. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. They had the same identity, but they were also one with one another. They grew in their unity because they saw that as vital, as essential. They prayed about that. They did a variety of things to assist in that. They were devoted to their unity. Despite having the same identity, we must strive to be one. A second consideration is despite role differences, we must continually strive for unity. Pick back up in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. Ephesians 4, uh, we'll look at verse 7 and 8 and then drop down to verse 11. Ephesians 4 verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Verse 11. He gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, We are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, for whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Certainly we all serve in different capacities. We all have different gifts. And a variety of those things, they they benefit all of us. And it's for the glory of God. As verse 12 mentions, it's for the equipping of the saints. It's for the building up of the body. Building us all up in love. Just consider a few of the different ways people lead. Certainly, we have elders who lead and guide with wisdom. Not everybody can do that. They either don't have the experience or are not qualified, whatever you want to put there. We have deacons who serve in a variety of ways. If you have any questions about what ways they serve, it's in the back uh, on the TV. We have some who excel at teaching. We have some who excel at greeting, making people feel welcome. We have a bunch of kids and young people here that come with energy and enthusiasm that we often need to see. Think about parents and families who bring their kids, who bring a lot of their kids and are here every time. They may not think about that, but that is encouraging because certainly I don't know what it's like to bring kids, but I know it's not easy by any means. Trying to get several kids here on time and and whatever else goes on there, I know there's effort involved there, more, more than I can even know, but that is appreciated. That encourages me and encourages many others as well. There are many who serve in the background. That there are a lot of things that get done that people are like, don't don't even think about. Think about the new Christians. Some new Christians think, well, how, how can I possibly serve? How can I contribute to the unity of the body? Well, simply your conversion, your dedication your zeal, your commitment, that all encourages us. That 
unifies us. That reminds us of what we have in Christ. We all serve in different capacities, but that does not make us any less than one another. It speaks to the beauty of God's church, to His brilliant plan. And certainly we cannot let pride or jealousy slip into that. And so how can I combat pride with these role differences? A couple of suggestions. One is, we must remember who we're serving. We mentioned this in Ephesians 3.21. Who, who are we serving? But it's for God. It's not for ourselves. Luke 17.10 talks about how we are unprofitable servants. That should be how our attitude is. So remember who we're serving, but remember who we are. That we should not have any pride or ego. Because we are just forgiven sinners. We were dead, but made alive in Christ. So remember who we're serving. Remember who we are. And remember who others are. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about how we recognize no one according to the flesh. And so how, how can you avoid pride with others? Well, see them differently. Don't see them according to the flesh, but see them as fellow saints. See them as fellow sons and daughters of God. See them as fellow heirs. See them as God's workmanship. See them as fellow citizens of God's household. And all those references are in Ephesians 1 and 2. And certainly along with that, again, chapter 4, verse 2, we must have humility, gentleness, patience, and tolerance in love. Despite a variety of role differences, we must continually strive to be one. For a third consideration, despite the past, we must continually strive to be one. Even if we have had great unity in the past, we must continually strive to be one. As we cannot be content with where our love is right now, that must grow. We can't be content with where our unity is right now. That must grow as well. In Revelation, there's a letter addressed to the Ephesian church. Within that letter, it said, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. When you look at the Ephesians, they had a great repentance in Acts. They had a great commitment to the Lord. And certainly in the letter of Ephesians, it seems like things are going pretty well at the time. But perhaps 30 or 40 years down the line, things have went a little bit south. They're doing a lot of the same good things. But it mentions they left their first love. Now does that mean they were going through the motions? Does that mean they had been, become content with their previous sacrifice? Well, we, we sacrificed so much before, we don't have to do that much more now. That they were content with their love, with their devotion, with their growth. Because those are things we cannot be content with. But we must continually grow. And with that, that includes unity as well. We cannot be content with our unity, but we can always grow closer to one another. We can always encourage one another more. We can always love one another more. We can always have more patience with each other. Look at look back at Ephesians now, chapter 5, and we'll pick up in verse 18. Ephesians 5 verse 18. Do not get drunk with wine, <clears throat> for that is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Here we have the idea of encouragement. We encourage one another with psalms of praise, with praying with one another, by reminding each other of what we are thankful for what we have in Christ, and we can serve one another as well. Consider a couple passages from the Hebrew author. 
Hebrews 3.13, encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Hebrews 10.24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. There are many one another passages in Scripture. We have a responsibility to one another. To be unified with one another. To encourage and serve one another. We have a responsibility to each other. We must grow in our unity. Again, we can always be more unified. But that's not even considering all the new members and families who must also be one with us as well. We've had a lot of new members and families come in. They need to be one with us as well, that we are all unified together. All the new Christians as well who must be one with us. They're not any less than any one of us, but we must all be one. Certainly, we must continually strive to be one. This morning... We have discussed the importance of unity. That God desires us to be one. That Jesus prayed for us to be one, and that should be our desire as well. But a lot of the unity we've discussed has been about, well, you're already in Christ, and we're being one with each other. That's assuming you're already in Christ, but perhaps today you are not in Christ. That is the dangerous spot to be in. But the good news for you is that today that can change. Today you can believe in Christ. Today you can repent of your sins. Today you can confess His name and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Just as Jesus said and commanded. And today is a perfect opportunity for that. Because we are not promised tomorrow. We're not even promised tonight. And so if you recognize your need to come into Christ, won't you come so we stand and sing?